Okay, so I've been working in the last um, number of months in terms of patents, access to healthcare and COVID-19. And I suppose just by way of both uh, a caveat and also, also kind of decoration in terms of conflicts, so I started working in this area because of some of the work I was doing with Access to Medicines Ireland. And there is specifically a campaign group of uh, medical practitioners, patient activists, and others that are interested in the access to medicine space within the Irish context. And as part of that work, I started to get asked the questions of, well, you know, to what extent are these issues likely to affect COVID-19 and access in the COVID-19 context? And I started to look at this. So some of, the, some of this work is really coming from that perspective, but of course it reflects my own views based on the research. So it doesn't necessarily reflect the position of Access to Medicines Ireland, but that's just the context where this was coming from, which I think is important because I end with some reforms and some reflections perhaps in terms of the Irish framework um, on how within that context um, we might need to think about in Ireland and I think in other jurisdictions as well, how the compulsory licensing systems are operating and also potentially what reforms are needed to make them more effective should they be needed for COVID-19. Um, so in terms of this uh, presentation, it's based on the work that, that's been presented here is based on two papers. One of them is forthcoming actually tomorrow, which is rather um, a good timing in terms of that, which is accidental timing really, but it's in the NILQ. And the other piece is a piece that's forthcoming in the Journal of Medical Ethics, which is just examining more broadly some of these issues, including the voluntary licensing uh, context as well, and kind of the solutions that could be used would we see access issues in this area. In terms of an overview, I'll start by highlighting some of the relevant issues I think that are happening within the access to medicine space for COVID, and then looking at compulsory licensing in terms of how that might be a tool used to reshift the balance in this context. It's not a panacea, and I'll make that point, and I'll highlight that actually there's many shortcomings to the way in which compulsory licensing operates in this context, but nonetheless, it is an important tool, I would say, that states would have within a broader arsenal if needed, and the hope is it won't be needed, but if needed, they would have those for uh, COVID-19 access. And then moving on from that, looking at the international and then the national level, the Irish context. But I suppose to start, um, really the discussion, the relevance of patents to access to health, and of course, we're all familiar with these areas. So I'm not going to dwell on this too much. We know what a patent is, and we also know that they're available in all fields of technology, including uh, medical technologies such as uh, medicines, diagnostics, elements of vaccines. And I've, I've deliberately called this patents on access to health, not just medicines, because I think it is important that we look at diagnostics, medicines, and also vaccines and how patents will affect across the life cycle of um, diagnostics and also treatment. And the other thing, I suppose, within the scientific community, there's lots of discussions around, um, you know, our vaccines, of course, if they are effective, that will be fantastic. But in the medium and short term, therapies are likely to be even more important and having effective therapies is really significant as well. And indeed, diagnostics to bring the outbreak under control. In terms of the implication patents have for access and delivery of healthcare, of course, we know there are many implications. Often within access to medicines, the focus tends to be around price. And of course, price is highly significant. And we know that from, I suppose, past issues such as the HIV AIDS crisis, where we're all familiar many years of um, petitioning and civil society action in order to get access to HIV AIDS medication, particularly in lower income countries. And it took until you had you know, serious developments there in terms of price for um, access to actually be delivered and of course amendments to the TRIPS agreement. So it's questionable, will we see a similar picture happening? I think in the COVID-19 context, hopefully we don't, but will we? But it's also not just, I think about price, it's important to stress, it's also about supply. If a patent holder refuses to um, license their technology to other manufacturers, or if they only license to a select number of manufacturers, or indeed if they do advanced deals with some particular countries for preferential access, which we've seen, and which others I know in the network are working on, such as Professor Duncan Matthews, if they're doing those types of deals, that is going to potentially cut down supply for other countries. And one example of this that we're already seeing is in the context of remdesivir. And remdesivir in during the summer, certainly, and at the start of the crisis, it was seen as a potentially effective treatment for COVID-19. Now, since then, in uh, October, actually, of this year, the World Health Organization issued an interim report, which actually suggests that remdesivir is not that effective, if effective at all. But nonetheless, at a point in time, it was seen as a successful potential 
um, tool to shorten the, the recovery time of patients suffering from COVID-19. And at that time as well, in August of this year, the US uh, Gilead agreed, which was the patent holder, agreed with the US to provide 100% of its uh, then manufacturing capacity to the US in August, and then 90% um, of its supply in September, sorry, 100% in July and 90% of its supply according to the Guardian in August and September was to go to the US. And of course, that means that unless it's going to license to others, that's going to limit the supply of technologies, the supply of remdesivir is specifically available elsewhere. Now, Gilead did conclude some voluntary licensing agreements, it has to be said, particularly with lower income countries subsequent to that. But nonetheless, we have seen that remdesivir was rationed, at least in the UK context. In the NHS context, there were reports around this in October when it was still seen as something that might be useful and potentially that's happening elsewhere. So these are not, I suppose, hypothetical issues. These are happening and these are things that I think as an IP community, we, we should be aware of and considering. And of course, we know that patents can potentially affect those that are willing to research on certain areas. So as I mentioned, COVID-19, it has had effects on the medicine context. But we've also seen it have had effects in other areas as well, right across the whole landscape, I suppose, between diagnosis and potentially vaccines. Now, in many of these instances, it has to be said that challenges were raised and subsequently or very soon after because of public backlash and reputational costs, potentially those challenges were dropped. So the market, in a sense, is rectifying itself. But that's still a chance that we're leaving there. So in terms of diagnostics, we know in March of 2020, just soon after the, this was declared to be a, a global pandemic by the World Health Organization, in the US context, there were claims that started to arise that one particular company, Labrador Diagnostics, was issuing a patent infringement challenge and an injunction to stop another company, Biofire Diagnostics, using some of its tools to develop COVID-19 testing. Now, that hit the headlines and soon after the challenge was dropped. So it didn't actually um, lead to or potentially lead to any impediments there. But nonetheless, that type of challenge is, I think, highly problematic and it could potentially be successful within the systems that we have. Remdesivir, as I mentioned in the medical contexts, companies um, providing preferential access to particular countries of their supplies, which goes against, I suppose, global equitable allocation of medicines and also is potentially harmful because of course this is a life and death decision in many cases if these treatments are effective. We also in the device context in um, March 2020 as well in the Italian context there were claims which were later refuted and they were um, suggested to be unsubstantiated but nonetheless claims started to arise that um, a, a, a group of people were producing 3D printing ventilator parts in um, Italy for use in Italian hospitals and it was reported, but it later proved to be um, unsubstantiated, but reported that they were being um, threatened with patent infringement or intellectual property infringement actions for that. Now, although, again, those claims were later dismissed and, and seen to not be substantiated, that that didn't actually happen in, in practice, the idea there that that could happen is also plausible. These types of claims could arise and there could be issues both with patents and also other types of intellectual property. And in terms of the vaccine context, we've already seen unfortunately that many countries are agreeing preferential access models and deals with patent holders and of course they're perfectly entitled to do so but that is going to lead to um, issues in terms of downstream access now you see on this particular slide which is a graph taken from um, the a nature article and the reference is on that for it this is actually from august 2020 so it's out of date by now but at this time it was suggesting that the uk had up to five doses per um, person of any of vaccines that they were purchasing at the time. That was the kind of agreements we're suggesting. And of course, this will have moved on since August. The US similarly, but then you look at the bottom, the lower and middle income countries through COVAX, much smaller amount of doses. And the other thing to say is some of the leading vaccine candidates require two doses. So a dose and then a booster dose. So, you know, you would need to be showing that you have two doses to be, I suppose, fully securing your, your population which of course most countries will not have based on these allocation models. So I think access to medicines are really in the spotlight or access to health is really in the spotlight with COVID-19 and it's not just about price and certainly the price is not necessarily going to deter access for 
most high income countries, although it could for lower income countries. But what will deter access, in my view, is the supply. And unless we have more manufacturers and more people doing that, and also I suppose supply chains are an issue too. But so it's not just patents that are an issue, but there has to be more supply and more equitable discussions around these areas. In terms of reshifting the balance, I suppose what we should be concerned about within the broader patent community to what extent patents play a role, and of course I can see they're not the only barrier to access in these areas at all, but I do think they can pose a potential barrier to access. And without concerted action to preempt some um, practices, so, um, so some behaviour that isn't perhaps responsible in the sense of facilitating public interest behaviours, um, I do think we could be in for further access to medicines issues in this context. And there's three main avenues that this could go down, I think, or three main ways. The two that I suggest first, voluntary licensing initiatives. So I'm not going to go into this in detail in this particular presentation, but happy to say more in discussion. But the World Health Organization in particular has um, set up a COVID technology access pool. And that access pool is, um, pool basically for intellectual property which encourages patent holders to voluntarily share their intellectual property rights, share data and also um, share their know-how and share cell lines etc in order for others to be able to make uh, technology, particularly health technologies for COVID-19. I think it's a really important development and I think it is something that governments should be endorsing. They have issued, the WHO has issued a solidarity call to action on that but so far, the last time I checked, only I think 41 countries and of those only five countries in Europe had supported that um, solidarity call to action. The UK and Ireland have not supported that. Despite that, however, our president, Michael D. Higgins, recently came out at a WHO a General Assembly discussion saying and pledging his support. He was saying he was supporting this and the countries should work together in solidarity. So that is one initiative, but it is voluntary. And because there isn't sufficient state support at the moment for that, it really hasn't, I think, got off the ground as much as it could potentially. Other measures include compulsory licensing. So where patent holders, of course, uh, do not give permission to others to license on reasonable terms, to what extent should states intervene? And then finally, I suppose the most radical solution of all is the one that's currently being tabled in the WTO, the waiver, the temporary waiver to the TRIPS agreement. So I suppose there are different ends of the spectrum, really. One is voluntary, so we're encouraging patent holders to sign up and to share their IP for the COVID context. The next one is whereby patent holders don't necessarily license on reasonable terms. We're ensuring states have effective avenues to have compulsory licenses where needed or to use as negotiation tools. And then third, and the most drastic one, I suppose, from the patent holders' perspective and the IP community is the waiver to the TRIPS agreement, a decision on which I think is still being postponed. So before moving on then to compulsory licensing in more detail and how it could be used in this context, I would acknowledge that it's not a panacea, but I do think it's part of a broader toolkit to address these issues. So compulsory licensing has many shortcomings in terms of resolving any potential access to healthcare issues in the COVID-19 context. First of all, the biggest, I suppose, issue with it is it's not a catch-all solution. Any compulsory licensing, as we know, has to be applied for on a case by case basis, product by product. You can't say that you are going to grant a compulsory license on COVID technologies or COVID vaccines or COVID medicines per se. And that is highly problematic if you're talking about an access to health context in, in one way, because what that means is that it's going to have to be country by country. So some countries will not have the infrastructure, may not have the supports to do this. And also it'll take a long time, it'll be bureaucratic. So this is certainly a shortcoming in terms of it being used as an only solution to COVID-19 access issues. The other thing that I would have to say is compulsory licensing. They're not the only, patents are not the only intellectual property rights that are important here. You also have, of course, trade secrets, which are very important and you know manufacturing know-how and also cell lines. And particularly for vaccines and complex biologics, actually knowing how a product is made and knowing the manufacturing process, knowing um, you know, simple things like the temperature and all of that, and obviously more complex aspects as well, is highly important in order to produce generic effects, the version of a vaccine. So just because you have a compulsory license doesn't mean that you're going to actually necessarily be able to produce your final vaccine in the same form. So that can be a downside as well to compulsory licensing. 
However, what I would say is just because it doesn't give you everything doesn't mean that we should abandon this as an approach because compulsory licensing can be a very useful tool in negotiating. And even though it is a country by country approach, if more states show their willingness to use compulsory licensing or at least show that their laws are effective to do so where needed, if there is not sufficient access to COVID-19 health technologies, that can be a very powerful, I think, negotiation tool. And it can also help to shift the balance. And the other thing I would say is the more states and particularly the more higher income states that are willing to or showing a willingness to use these um, various measures, that can also potentially give strength in numbers in order to negotiate better deals with um, manufacturers, with patent holders as well. And I suppose that brings us to the, the other big I suppose, elephant in the room is the willingness of states to use it. So historically, we have seen that many particularly higher income countries have not really used these measures to date. There have been threats of backlash of um, trade sanctions that we've seen in the past. And again, you know, that is kind of a deterrent for using these measures and particularly for countries that have big, strong, big pharmaceutical lobbies. But COVID-19 is, I think, a catalyst for change in that area because it's a global pandemic affecting everyone that, you know, all of us want to eventually have a solution to. And the other thing is some countries have already changed their laws in response to COVID-19 to make it clear that um, the systems can use compulsory licenses where needed. So Germany, France and other jurisdictions have already made amendments to their legislation, national laws, to um, make it easier, I suppose, and more accessible to get compulsory licenses if needed. We've also seen the first compulsory license issued in the COVID-19 context was in March, where Israel issued a compulsory license on Caltrera, which was an existing um, drug, existing antiretroviral that was thought to be useful in the COVID-19 context. And when they did that, what happened was the patent holder, instead of backlash, actually, they agreed not to enforce their patents worldwide on that drug for use in COVID-19. So in that way, I suppose that's one example, but it does show that actually by using compulsory licensing, it can encourage broader change in these areas. And also, I suppose more recently, we've seen in the last week, um, Russia, I think, are threatening to use uh, compulsory licenses in the context of remdesivir for treating COVID-19. So then turning to, well, what's the possibility for this system? So what I would suggest is that in order for this to be effective and to be a viable option or a negotiation tool, it is important in my view for national states to look at their patent laws and to ensure that the compulsory licensing provisions are clear enough and are accessible enough in order to be used for COVID-19. I'm not suggesting that they would necessarily be used, but I do think it's important that the systems provide effective um, avenues if needed and effective avenues, I suppose, as well as a negotiation tool. But in order to do that, we first of all need to see, well, what's the international framework for this? Because that provides, I suppose, a template within which national WTO states can operate. So that provides that template. And what I've seen is some countries are applying higher standards than are necessarily required within that system. I think that's problematic. And I also think some countries need to make it clear that they can use or they are prepared to use compulsory licenses if needed within the healthcare, particularly COVID-19 context. So in terms of the international framework applicable, and again, many of us will be very familiar with this, but just to recap, the Paris Convention is relevant in this context, particularly Article 5, and also the TRIPS Agreement Article 31, which discusses um, compulsory licenses or use without authorization. Also relevant, of course, the Doha Declaration and Article, 5, or Article 31 bis, to that, to the TRIPS agreement. And the other thing to bear in mind is the European Union for EU states is a signatory of the TRIPS agreement, which doesn't mean the TRIPS is directly binding within EU law, but it does mean that mm. domestic courts interpret the provisions as far as possible in light of the wording of the TRIPS agreement. And of course, then we have the national level because all compulsory licensing is, it operates in a sense, in practical terms, it operates at the national level, which has to, of course, take into account these um, international and multilateral agreements when um, operating their systems. So in terms of the Paris Convention, there was no reference to compulsory licensing initially in the initial 1883 convention. It was only subsequently that that was, in fact, um, discussed. And then Article 5, as amended, now provides that 
states shall have the right to take legislative measures providing for the grant of compulsory licenses to prevent the abuses which might result from the exercise of exclusive rights conferred by the patent, for example, failure to work. So that's a relatively broad provision which gives states you know, a significant amount of discretion, I would suggest. And the one example is given, it's clearly not an exhaustive example. It's, you know, failure to work is given as an example. So there is relative discretion for states to you know, adopt grounds that they wish for compulsory licensing within that. Article 5.4, though, does provide a time restriction that if a compulsory license is granted on the basis of failure to work, that that would only be granted, it couldn't be granted before the expiration period of four years from the date of filing or three years from the date of the grant, whichever expires last. So it's a time restriction. In terms of the TRIPS agreement, then, of course, there's more substantive provisions there, and these provisions would have to be met. And some of the key ones, not all of them, but some of the key ones in terms of compulsory licensing and how they might affect COVID-19 include the following. So all of these under Article 31. The first one that is that each authorization must be considered on its individual merits. And that, of course, brings us back to the point that you couldn't have a blanket authorization, for example, for you know, compulsory licenses on COVID-19 vaccines. That is not possible under the framework for compulsory licensing. Or if, if a country did that, it would be in breach potentially of this provision. Secondly, these licenses are only granted if the proposed user previously tried to obtain an authorization for use, and that obviously fails. So they've tried to obtain a voluntary license and that has not been successful. But of course, the, the exception to that is the case of a national emergency or other circumstance of extreme urgency. And the interesting thing on this, when we look at, well, what do they mean by a national emergency? The Doha Declaration provides that it's up to the member state to decide what constitutes a national emergency or other circumstance of extreme urgency. And in particular, it's understood as a public health crisis, including those relating to HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and other epidemics. So surely a pandemic, which, you know, of course, is more severe than an epidemic, would fall directly within that. So that would suggest COVID-19 is a national emergency, or at least a state could um, make the point that it was a national emergency. And if so, then they wouldn't necessarily have to negotiate with the patent holder prior to adopting a compulsory license if they chose to do that for COVID-19, in my view. Thirdly, however, the scope and the duration of the license, it has to be limited to the purpose for which it was authorized. So potentially, if it was authorized in the emergency context to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic, potentially that might be viewed once the pandemic is declared to have ended, the COVID-19, the compulsory license rather, would then have to, I suppose, end at that point. And that could be highly problematic if that were the case, because of course, even if the pandemic ends, people are still going to need access to vaccines and therapies. So that could be an issue with this. The fourth point is authorization or a license must be non-exclusive. And fifthly, any use under a compulsory license is authorized predominantly for the supply of the domestic market. Of course, this was highly problematic in the HIV AIDS crisis. And as a result, we had changes to the overarching um, TRIPS framework, including a clarification that there were some circumstances within which countries could import, particularly if they didn't have sufficient um, domestic manufacturing capacities. So some states could get around that by invoking Article 31 bis, particularly, I suppose, lower income countries. However, in this context, if we think about a pandemic, that could affect, depending on how it was playing out in a country at any point in time, and as we've seen with COVID, it has had devastating effects. It could potentially, if it was, if the outbreak was to deteriorate, in a country lead to issues with manufacturing supply leading to you know workplace issues and issues around manufacturing even potentially in a higher income country in my view and so in some cases there might be a question over whether a higher income country would actually want would actually need to i know it's an extreme example but may need to invoke a provision like this if their manufacturing supply was affected or potentially if they didn't have um, sufficient supply chain in that particular country could they use this measure and the answer to this at the moment is currently no in any European Union context because any state can be an eligible importing mem member, but some states have opted out of this ability and the EU is one of those states. So currently with the EU's opt out of this particular article 31 bis, they've declared they're not going to use it. 
that means that no EU state could use this at the moment. And there have been strong calls actually for the European Union to declare that they are an eligible importing member or to declare that in the case of an emergency or a circumstance of urgency, that they are going to be an eligible importing member. So that's potentially highly problematic. And we'll come back to that. Sixthly, patent holders have to be paid adequate remuneration in each case for use of a compulsory license. There are some guidelines on this in terms of World Health Organization guidelines, which are on the slide. However, arguably, this could be a deterrent for some states if they're not sure you know, how much will they have to pay under this. And arguably, greater guidance on this at a national level may encourage you know, greater engagement with these types of provisions if needed or not necessarily guidance on the specifics, but guidelines on how this was going to be um, determined, the adequacy of the remuneration. And secondly, compulsory licenses are liable to termination if and when the circumstances which led to it cease to exist and are unlikely to reoccur. So that phrase, unlikely to reoccur, is an important one, I think, in a pandemic context, because arguably, even if the pandemic ended, one could, there might still be an epidemic in a country, or one could still say that you know, they might reoccur. So that might be a, something of relevance in this context. So in terms of those provisions, I think they're important ones because they set the framework within which national WTO states can amend their laws if they want to, or can have their laws drafted with, to meet the TRIPS requirements. The key shortcomings, I suppose, in terms of what those frameworks, what that framework does in terms of how countries can use these if needed for COVID-19, as I've said, it has to be a case by case basis. So it's fragmented. It's not a catch all solution, but however, used alongside voluntary licensing initiatives, which are complementary, of course, to nature, I do think it is an important aspect to have in that broader toolkit for states. Secondly, the adequate remuneration could potentially deter states. And thirdly, I think the three year requirement in cases of licenses for failure to work, um, that in itself, I don't think is necessarily problematic, but some states, as we'll see, including in Ireland, have adopted that three year requirement for all categories of compulsory licenses. That's a higher potentially requirement, which could, you know, in some cases be problematic. But of course, most medicines will take longer than three years to get regulatory approval. So this is unlikely to be a real practical issue for the majority of medicines, although in the COVID-19 context with some of the, um, you know, fact, we were trying to fast track some of the processes that might be an issue. But again, it's likely to be um, an exceptional case rather than the norm. So the key is TRIPS is also difficult to change, particularly within the short term. So I'm not suggesting any changes to the TRIPS framework. And the other point is there has to be a balance for intellectual property rights holders. And I do think any, um, any desire to have change within that overarching framework is likely to be met within with backlash and is likely also to take a considerable time. So pragmatically, what I would be suggesting is that countries should work within that framework to ensure national laws are as effective as possible within the confines that it has. And in doing so, I think some countries are adopting or have adopted higher standards than are necessarily required. And in my view, those should be you know, re-evaluated and we should be making sure that they're not adopting higher standards than are needed within the international framework. Some frameworks might be bureaucratic, they might warrant further guidance. That could be deterring use in these contexts. And again, I think that needs to be looked at. And finally, I think it would be useful in order to encourage willingness of countries to use compulsory licenses where needed for COVID-19 to have express statements which say, you know, compulsory licensing can be provided for in many circumstances, including within the public health context. Because we do have that at an international level, but we don't necessarily have those statements at a national level. And just to show, you know, this example in practice, I've taken the case study of Ireland. Um, so, and by Ireland, I mean the laws within the Republic of Ireland, although our laws are very similar and in some cases have developed actually from the system that's applicable in the UK. So there will be a lot of overlap within the existing system in the UK on this. In the Irish context, compulsory licenses exist alongside government use licenses. So again, very similar to the UK context. So our government use licenses are called licenses for service of the state. But effectively, it's identical almost to the crown use provisions that exist under um, the English system or the UK system. And those are a package, I think, of complementary measures, the compulsory licensing general provisions and the government use provisions in Ireland. They work in complementary to each other. The current measures, in my view, are relatively broad in theory, and they could potentially be interpreted to offer compulsory licenses for COVID-19. In some cases, in many cases, I think they could, in theory, 
but Irish law does impose some higher standards than needed. There's some, some areas that there could be reforms. And also, I think more importantly, there's no reference to public health, to the public interest within the general compulsory licensing laws. And I think that's problematic because although in theory they could be interpreted to provide compulsory licenses in this way, we know that when provisions provide a lot of discretion, and this is something that I've written about in the past, what can happen is those provisions can be open textures, they can require the person who's you know, making decisions on them, such as the person applying for the license, but more particularly the decision makers, the court or other body that's granting the license to interpret those provisions in a way which allows them to be used within the public health context in this example. And often when we have open, protect, open texture provisions that can entrench a status quo because there can be fears of actually using provisions in a new way. And in the Irish context has been limited to no use of these compulsory licensing provisions. So I did contact the intellectual property office and they have uh, to ask them how often have we used these provisions in Ireland and their response is that they have not been used. Now, I'm skeptical of that. I need to, to look at that again further myself, but that was the response that I was given that they, they, so there's limited or no use of these provisions in Ireland. So although we don't need to have an express legislative provision that says that they would be used in the health context, I think if we did have, it would encourage more use and it would also importantly, in, it would show that there is a legislative um, basis for, for using this in the health context and that would encourage the ability to use them as well and effectiveness of them to be used. So I do think there has to be or should be reforms of this area. In terms of the specifics, under Irish law, so compulsory licensing can be granted under Section 70 of the Patents Act as amended. And the main ground of relevance in the COVID-19 or indeed broader medical context would be on the basis of demand. So compulsory license can be granted if the demand in the state for the subject matter of the patent is not being met or not being met on reasonable terms. Um, now, price is not is not you know, necessarily a consideration that can be taken into account from previous case law on that. Um, it suggests that price would necessarily be something that you could look at, but nonetheless, demand not be met on, or not be met on reasonable terms. There's no reference to public interest or to health within the general compulsory licensing ground in Ireland. And the other thing to say is all of the grounds for compulsory licensing, um, they can only be granted three years after the publication of notice of the grant. So that seems to be a reflection of the Paris Convention requirement, but in the Irish context, it doesn't just reflect failure to work, it applies for all grounds of compulsory licensing. And my suggestion would be within the Irish context that there should be some discussion and potentially an express reference to public interest or public health. So for example, could there be a ground that would say compulsory licensing would be granted where necessary for the public interest? And if so, would it be plausible to include a non-exhaustive list, for example? And this, of course, I think would be open to a potential um, backlash or, or certainly opposition. But for example, could we say that it would be included in cases of national emergency, including within a public health crisis, e.g. epidemic, pandemic, environmental emergency, or economic crisis? So that would be a suggestion that I would um, propose. And a specific reference, although, as I said, not needed for us to use a compulsory license in this way, I think would be useful to signify, well, as a country, we are willing to use this if needed, and that potentially would encourage willingness to engage with this, or at least to make the threat of compulsory licenses, were that ever to be threatened, to make that more, um, not necessarily effective, but more plausible that it could happen. The other thing is the time requirement. I would suggest that we remove the, um, the, we remove the three year requirement for all grounds, grounds and instead just impose it in the context of failure to work as is required by the Paris Convention. And then also that there would be further guidance at a national level on how demand within the state is to be assessed, particularly because there isn't much guidance on that at all at the moment. And also a discussion and some further guidance perhaps on how adequate remuneration will be assessed within the, with the, the guidelines within the Irish context for that. The other thing then to say is those measures obviously sit alongside the government use provisions, so the service of the state measures akin to the crown use provisions within the UK context. Section 77 of the Patent Acts um, puts this provision in place and it allows the government minister or a person authorised by them to do any of the following, and you can see there they can make the product, 
um, if it's an invention, they can use it, they can offer supply or um, offer to supply any person, any means of that. And the other thing to say is, in terms of the terms of the government use, these are specifically for service of the state, which is defined in the legislation as any service that is essentially paid for by the public purse. Um, so health services would undoubtedly, in my view, be covered by that because, of course, that is a public health service under the health services executive in Ireland. In terms of the use of the invention, so the terms that a government would use these technologies under service of the state provisions, they have to be agreed either before or after the use. And they would be agreed between the parties or referred or can be referred to the High Court and if there isn't an agreement. And that High Court can then refer it on to an arbitrator at the end. In my view, that could be problematic in the remuneration context in particular, because if the terms aren't agreed upon until after the use, that might deter a state from you know, seeking government use because the remuneration could be higher than they expected. So there should be greater guidance in my review, my view on remuneration and particularly on the terms again in this context. The other thing to say is section 78.1, that allows for uses for service of the state for any purpose where a necessary expedient to a minister. And here is, I suppose, where you get more to the heart of public interest. They say for maintenance of supply or services essential to the life of the community, for securing a sufficiency of supplies and services essential to the well-being of the community, or for ensuring the public safety and the preservation of the state. So A and B in particularly, I think, could be viewed maintenance of supplies essential to the life of the community, arguably, you know, a vaccine or a therapy or even a diagnostic, I think, would be deemed to be essential to the life of the community, particularly in the pandemic context. Similarly, for B, I think that would fall within well-being and even for F, public safety and preservation of the state, given the numbers suffering from COVID-19 and also the um, health, economic and other social implications of it. So I do think that COVID-19 scenario would fall within this if needed, but there would be benefit to having greater guidance on how sufficiency is defined because currently there is limited discussion, guidance or indeed writings on these areas. So I think greater guidance on how sufficiency is to be determined. So sufficiency of supplies or maintenance of supplies, how that's to be determined within the context of this provision would be very useful. And the other thing to say is, and this, I suppose, is a, is a problem in my view, Section 78, that provision that we've just discussed, it's only to be used in exceptional circumstances. And the legislation specifically sets this out. It says, where the government are of the opinion that owing to the existence of exceptional circumstances, it is desirable that the interest of a community that a power conferred in that section be available. Now, in my view, by saying, you know, we're only going to use this in exceptional circumstances, that potentially poses a very high threshold on a government seeking to use this provision. And I can see why you would have that because of course, it's it's going to go against the incentive function of a patent if you're using this uh, regularly. So I'm not suggesting it would be used in a regular way, but I do think exceptional circumstances, that phrasing is problematic. And in my view, if that were to be removed, the reference to exceptional circumstances, and instead, if we were to say something like, where the government are of the opinion that it is necessary in the interests of the community, that a power be conferred. So you're still saying it's not it's not necessarily going to be a regular use, but you're saying it's in the interest of a, a view that is necessary to the community. I think that would be preferable. And perhaps as well as part of that, an express um, acknowledgement that this might include a circumstance of health emergency, including, for example, pandemic epidemic context, making a non-exhaustive list as well. I think that would encourage greater willingness to use this provision if needed for the COVID-19 context. And the final points, just to kind of end on this, because I know we're getting close to the time if I haven't gone over already, but the other thing to say is there are regulatory obstacles to practical use of compulsory licensing. So I've been talking mostly about the legal potential obstacles to use or willingness to use, but there's also um, great work done by Ellen Tohone and others who highlight the impact of data exclusivity protections. So within the European context, there are data exclusivity protections for eight to 10 years for any um, patented uh, medicine, for example. And that means that the clinical data, the trial data on those may not necessarily be possible to use to get approval for a generic product. And that can be a huge um, impediment to the practical use of compulsory licensing. And there's no um, exception to that when a compulsory license is granted. So others have called in the past for there to be a waiver to that protection when you have a compulsory license. And that's also important to consider. 
And as I mentioned in the course of the presentation, the opt-out, the, the EU's opt-out as an importing state or an eligible member state um, in terms of Article 31 bis. So, you know, there have been calls for this to be changed, including calls by Jamie Love, who has described it as totally irrational for any country, even a rich country, to keep its own hands tied to meet the COVID-19 needs of its population, voluntarily shutting itself off from patented ingredients. So he discusses that at length in some of his work. And I do think it's important that there is a conversation around perhaps opting out of that, or at the very least um, saying that, you know, we will, as EU states, we potentially could use it in the event of an emergency or circumstances of urgency. And as part of this whole process, I suppose, where I'm coming at from is the need to reconsider the national laws and to think about, are they as effective as they could be? We won't necessarily use compulsory licensing, but if we do need to use them, are the laws that are effective to allow us to do so and to really rebalance the power that exists within this overarching system and to encourage countries to also support voluntary um, licensing initiatives like the CTAP initiative in order to ensure that we have access to and delivery of effective um, healthcare for COVID-19 in future. So I'll leave it there. There's just the two citations to um, the two pieces this presentation is really based on. So thanks everyone. And I would welcome, really welcome any questions or any comments, particularly about any of the reforms, but anything, you know, there, any suggestions anyone has?